Headline edition July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile found... And welcome to another edition of the Shadowland Radio Show. I am your host, Dr. William Lester. And as always, we are coming to you from the city of Atlanta. I want to take this opportunity to thank all of the new people who have come on board with their subscriptions on uh, YouTube. And also the many, many people who have uh, emailed in and offered their positive commentary on the show. A lot of people have been uh, talking about the show, commenting on the show on Facebook as well, where you can see the uh, each episode. Uh, we have 17 archived episodes uh, on YouTube and on Facebook. On today's show, we have a wonderful guest. Uh, her name is Joni Mahan. She is a resident of the state of Massachusetts, and she is quite an accomplished author. She has published such books as Devil's Toy Box, Bones in the Basement, and a trilogy, the Winter Woods Trilogy. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to call these out, and I hope I don't get them out of order. Uh, uh, Spirit Board... Uh, Labyrinth and Corvus. Now, if that's not the right order, she will she will get us straight uh, in just a few minutes. So let's not waste any time. Let's bring her on. Joni Mahan, how are you? Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So we talked about this trilogy here, the Winter Woods trilogy. So I know because we, we talked earlier that Spirit Board is book one. So what's the order? What's the the other two. That's correct. Okay. Spirit Board, and then the Labyrinth, and then the Corvus. Okay. And give us a little bit about, you know, what's the plot, what's the twist, what, what kind of stories are these? Well, as a paranormal investigator, I like being turned loose with fiction because then I can create a story that has no boundaries. And uh, this story kind of encompasses all the things that I find creepy, and I wrap it into a suspenseful story. And it follows um, a 16-year-old girl named Winter Woods, whose family moves to this small, quaint town in Indiana. And she has a feeling something's wrong with the town right away. Something just doesn't feel right. And uh, in the first book, she finds a spirit board in her closet. And when she uh, pulls it out and uses it for the first time, it kind of starts unleashing some things. And she starts to learn a little bit more about what the town is about. So. And it follows through with the three books with a few different themes. Okay, absolutely. And then the one that captured my attention just because of the, the title, it's, it sounds so ominous, is Devil's Toy Box. Right. Yeah. Um, that's a true story, and that's uh -oh. something that happened to me um, back uh, in the late 80s, early 90s when um, I moved into my first house that I, it was my then husband and I was pregnant and 
uh, I'm a sensitive, so I'm sensitive to uh, spiritual energy or when a ghost is nearby. And I picked up on something right away, but I wasn't really willing to admit what I was picking up on. And the house was indeed haunted. And the psychological torture was uh, just immense. I, you know, been investigating for years now, and living in that house was the scariest thing I've ever gone through. So, uh, as a sensitive, I've, I've, I've often wondered, you know, when you pick up on, a, on the presence of a ghost, w what is it that you are, what's that feeling? What are, you, what's, what are you seeing? What's happening with you when you know that a ghost is, like, right there? Well, I'm what they call clairaudient. So I hear, it's called clear hearing. So I hear a tone. Some people that with disability will actually hear voices, and I'm thankful that I do not hear voices, but I hear something similar to ear ringing. And it took me a long time to acknowledge the fact that it really was not ear, ear ringing, that I could localize the sound and track it around the room. And that sensation also came with the feeling of being watched and just the feeling of somebody being close by. And it just, uh, it was a very eerie feeling. And as I was in that house, I would get that pretty frequently. So it was crazy. Do you feel, do you feel like the, does the spirit generate that tone? Um, I think so. I think it's the sound that they, their vibration makes. And it's oh. for that reason I can pick up on it. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways people will pick up on ghosts. And some people will feel it physically. Uh, some people even smell something, you know, they might smell the smell of somebody's perfume or cigar smoke and uh, other people get a mind picture. Uh, for me, it's the clear audience where I hear the tone. So the tone that they generate would be, say, outside the range of normal hearing for us. Yeah, it's, um, it's as I've gotten more adept at this, once you embrace uh, a mediumship ability, it usually grows stronger, and that's what happened to me. I really didn't start buying into it completely until probably about 2008, 2009. And uh, once I started focusing on it, it grew stronger, and I'm able to actually differentiate between male and female from the tones. And um, really? yeah, and I'm starting to get more um, more involvement with it. Like I can tell you if it's. Uh, what its intent is. If it's not a good one, I get definitely get that feeling. And sometimes I'll get a mind picture to go along with it. And um, it's always helpful to be able to validate that with somebody else that has stronger abilities. And so I've worked with several psychic mediums since then and have been able to um, confirm that, you know, what I'm feeling and what I'm seeing in my mind is correct. So it's, it's an odd thing to have as a gift, but, uh, you know, you don't get to pick those things. So you said that you kind of bought in in 2008. Uh, what, were, were you reluctant and why? You know, was it just... Well, because, you know, before that point in time, you know, it was scary to me. And uh, I just assumed they were all demons and they were all out to get me. And, you know, it was really scary. And, you know, since that point in time, I have learned that, uh, you know, probably 95% of them are just earthbound ghosts. And they don't mean anybody any harm, they just stuck around, and they don't even necessarily want anything. Uh, it's that 5% you have to worry about. <laughs> yes, and uh, tell us about that, because, you know, that that's a, that could be a very different experience. Uh, have you ever encountered, like, one of the 5%? Oh, yeah, many times. Actually, my book, The Soul Collector, chronicalizes uh, my experience with a very negative entity. Uh, possibly demonic. I hate using that term because so many people throw it around so loosely, but I uh, had a, a t an attachment that came on, and it was about the time I started really opening up my abilities and testing it and trying you know, to see what I could do with it and investigating as well. And something latched on to me, and he was with me for a good few months, and it was oh. it was really scary. And, they called me. Yeah. So if you, I mean, if it's if it's too personal, you don't have to. But what kind of things, you know, were happening with this attachment? Was it attacking you? What what was going on? Well, they called it a soul collector because uh, some entities will collect other souls and they use their energy. And and it, as weird as it sounds, it was absolutely true. He was 
a lot of it was psychological, like I get feeling there. Um, but he would also make noises, he'd move things, he'd um, make banging sounds on the walls, and um, items would disappear and reappear, uh, lights would come on and off when they weren't. And it was almost like Chinese water torture, like he'd wait until I'd get comfortable, and I'd kind of forget about it and try to relax, and then all of a sudden something would happen. And I was seeing dark shadows in the hallway, and you know, things walking by the doorway. It was, you know, it was crazy. But I mean, a psychic medium was really the one that clued me in on what was going on with me. And she couldn't pull it off of me for a good couple months because she had things going on and it was a very strong entity. She could pull it off for short periods of time, but then it would come right back again. And uh, it was, you know, he, one thing he did was um, he would, he could manipulate uh, electronics like nobody could get in touch with me my phone just wouldn't ring and uh, if I go to call somebody like I had one um, uh, investigator who did uh, house blessings and he worked with the Catholic Church to do exorcisms and if I tried to call him and reach out for help when I would call him all of a sudden my phone would fill with static and uh, we couldn't talk and you know, it would play music on my on my phone. Like all of a sudden, my phone would be sitting there, and it'd start blasting a song. And uh, it was it was crazy. People didn't like being at my house if they came over. It just you just felt like um, somebody was staring you down. It was pretty scary. And can you describe the process uh, by which you were able to get rid of this thing? I don't want to give too much away because I want people to read the book, but oh. It, it, yeah, it did involve a lot. It involved, they did a deliverance on me, you know, which is the lay person's version of an exorcism, um, and that did not work. So they had to go to drastic measures, which involved a coven of witches from Salem. So it, <laughs> it gets pretty crazy. So now, wait a minute. Now, this was, now, let's get this straight now. So this story is, this is chronicled in Devil's Toy Box, right? No, this is the Soul Collector. Oh, Soul Collector. Wait, okay, let's see. So, Soul Collector, because we didn't call that one out at the intro. Oh, no. Uh, the Soul Collector, uh, the true story of one paranormal investigator's worst nightmare. Mm-hmm. And this is released in 2013, so it's out there in paperback uh, now. And... Yeah. Yeah, and, and and electronics, ebooks, ebook, e- ebook, ebook format. So, mm-hmm. uh, I'm definitely I might have to jump on that one first because that's very intriguing. Uh, it's very. And and so the the lots more details of this personal experience are are documented in this book. So that's that's one we're going to definitely recommend. Now, uh, you were or you are a paranormal investigator uh and you know was that started because like of a lifelong interest was that started because of your gifts of being a sensitive what led you to that uh pretty much all of the above um you know when you're sensitive you're always drawn to the paranormal because it doesn't leave you alone it's not like you can turn your back on it and forget about it if they come to you and in my quest to learn more information i started doing more research and uh, research led me to actually going out investigating and I met up with some like-minded people that you know were also learning you know how to investigate how to use their abilities and um, it just kind of led to me being an investigator kind of one of those things you never really plan on happening but it just kind of ends up there Wow. and now you live in, in Massachusetts and that is a very you know it's a very historical place uh, it's one of like the older places in America, and there are a lot of like supernatural things attributed to Massachusetts. Uh, have you ever investigated some of those historical things there? Oh yeah, you know every chance that I get, um, I've been to uh, Rose Island Lighthouse. I've been to um, the Concord Colonial Inn in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, Rolling Hills Asylum. I actually been to, um, oh, I don't know, a lot of local places. Any place that's been haunted that I can get into, I pretty much the Shanley, which is in yeah. New York. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, 
but you really don't have to go to those haunted locations like that to find ghosts because they are everywhere. Right. Um, you know, they're they're in they're in hotels, they're in people's houses, they're in grocery stores, they're in WalMarts. Uh, you know, if you're sensitive, you start picking up on them and you realize just how many there are out there that maybe most people aren't aware of. When there's a ghost in a place, I, and I, I'm I'm guessing there could be a number of reasons, but mm-hmm. let's just say that there's a ghost and they don't really want anything they're just kind of hanging around i mean what are the different reasons you know some of these ghosts are not necessarily out to bother people right 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 and they have a variety of reasons why they don't uh why they don't cross over you know into the light to go where they're supposed to go which some people call heaven you know they they could have um stayed behind to watch for out over family maybe uh they want to they feel their ju- their death was um, unjustified, and they want to investigate it. Or, uh, in a lot of cases, though, they have guilt, and they feel that if they go and they try to cross over, they're going to be held accountable for something bad that they perceive they did on this plane. And it, it, you know, the churches teach people that yes. you know, you do something bad, like commit suicide. A lot of suicides hang around because they're afraid they're going to go to hell if they go to cross over. So. Uh, a lot of what I do now as an investigator isn't involved in, you know, harassing them and asking them questions. It's in trying to do soul rescues. So uh, I teach a Paranormal 101 class now, and several of my students are very uh, talented psychic mediums. And what we've been doing is going to some of these locations and uh, doing kind of soul counseling, which... Uh, is very effective because sometimes they just don't know that they can cross over, they can go where they need to go, and we just talk to them and give them the opportunity, and it's always free will. They can cross over if they want to, and we've cleared a few locations, and uh, which really feels a lot better than getting good evidence, you know, setting somebody's soul free. Let me ask you a question that can get you in trouble. Okay. What does it mean for organized religion if a person you know, spiritually has free will to do what they want to do? Um, well, you know, religion is really, uh, um, organized religion is really a man-made function. Um, you know, everybody says that they, um, you know, that their information comes from a higher source. But, you know, when so many different religions follow different patterns, how do you truly know if uh, this is accurate or this is not accurate? Um you know, I think that it's really dependent on um, on. Oops, I almost lost you. Uh, I think it's dependent on on you know the soul itself, and um, you know we have the ability to cross over. We're allowed to go to heaven or you know to the afterlife, as it were. But the idea, yeah. the idea that ultimately it's up to us mm-hmm. is, it is. The, is the thing. Which now, don't get me wrong. I think that's good. I, and I think I think that's probably correct, just kind of based on, you know, what we've seen and experienced with the paranormal. Uh, but I would imagine that for some people who, you know, do a strict interpretation of some some of their theology, mm-hmm. that it might be troubling. Uh, that you know, there's nobody there's nobody waiting there, you know, judge and jury, mm-hmm. you know, to call out good guys and bad guys. Well, I think that, um, you know, from what I've learned, uh, and honestly, none of us know for sure because none of us have been there back, but my feelings based on what I've heard from talking to different people and research is that uh, there there are lessons to be learned when you cross over. You do go through a life review and you do go through things that you did and uh, you, you perceive it from your point of view as well as from everybody's point of view that it affected. So it's kind of like a ripple effect. And... Uh, you are your own judge and jury, um, you know. So when you, you know, when you have the opportunity to come back and you know try again, you have um, you have a lot to, you have to work on. So I think there's like a you know school for souls when we cross over. Do you, in your in your view and your experience and what you're able to sense, uh, can these spirits go? And I, I, I want to articulate this correctly. Obviously, and, and 
an earthbound spirit, a ghost is not really confined by physical boundaries or limitations. Is that correct? Um, I, I really don't think that they are. Um, they can go where they want to go. Sometimes they feel like they're trapped. It's, you know, their perception of the situation. But they don't have to die at a house in order for that house to be haunted. They could be. They could come in attached to somebody else, or they could just be wandering around and and end up there. So okay. uh, they can go pretty much where they want to go, unless they're being kept somewhere. So sometimes there are stronger entities that'll hold them in place, kind of like the soul collector. Huh. They they hold them in place so they can use their energy. Okay. Now my next question about this is the following thing: Can these entities, or are these entities, bound? by what we think of as time. No, I don't think so. I think time is irrelevant to them. Um, especially if, um, I think if, you know, if they've crossed over, they can come back and visit. You know, people right. will often feel like a relative is there watching over them. And uh, I don't think time means anything to them. I think time is something that means something to us, but I don't think it means anything to them. Well, in other words, if, if, if you were a ghost, would you be able to travel or move or experience things that occurred in different time periods, not just the time of your actual physical life? I think so, but, you know, then again, you know, how do we know? We're specu uh, yeah, it's speculation, yeah. and I, I was just wondering. Yeah. You know, well, could, I longer that they're earthbound, the more they forget um, from my, our investigations and just going from a scientific side, uh, when we do EVP sessions where we were using digital recorders to record their responses, a lot of times they won't answer questions about, you know, what year they remember living or, uh, you know, we try not to ask when they died because I think that's disrespectful. Um, and it brings back a lot of hurt for them because that's one moment they don't want to remember. But um, sometimes they are intelligent. You can say what day of the week is it is, and you'll get you know Wednesday or Sunday or whatever day it is on the recorder. So it, I think it really ent entirely depends on the entity you're talking to. And you said that you know some of these ghosts may feel that they are trapped in a situation, mm -hmm. and it's just. Uh, what is it? is it? Is it a realization that they have to have, or is this something you've helped them with, right? Yeah, yeah, we do. We will help them. They feel sometimes they sometimes they just become narrowed down to their last emotion, and the longer they're earthbound, the less they ties they have with their human life, and all they remember is the agony or the misery or the sadness, and uh, you know, because they don't have to go through the daily functions that people go through you know they become narrowed down to their emotions which you know could be really tough wow what is and i know you talked about the events that are chronicled in, in the soul collector are there other scary moments that you've had out there as an investigator not necessarily something happening to you at your house Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, every time I go on investigation, you know, there's some element of danger or, you know, perceived danger, even fear. Um, one of the most haunted locations I've investigated is Rolling Hill Asylum, and that's in uh, East Bethany, New York, upstate New York, near Buffalo. And um, it's incredibly haunted. I've been there, I think, three times now. And one time I was there we weren't getting a lot of activity and so I was trying to trying something I was still experimenting with my abilities I've learned that if I really focus on listening to a tone it it kind of draws them in closer so I was trying to pull them in closer so we would have some experiences and then all of a sudden I saw this snake like form of like almost smoke coming towards me kind of like a snake and it went right through my body. And when it went through my body, it was like my like I took a deep breath. I felt my body like um, like my chest rise, and and then it went out the back of me, and it left me very cold and very shaken, because that was pretty terrifying to have one go right through you. Was it was that a go what was it? I mean, was it just a ghost playing tricks on you? Was it something? Oh, I'm sure it was 
yeah, I'm sure it was a ghost uh, teaching me a lesson. You know, be careful what you wish for. Yeah. <laughs> you may get it. Wow. Uh, you talked about uh, a a 101 course. Uh, tell us more about that. Well, after writing my books, uh, I I have another book, Bones in the Basement, which yes. is centered in Gardner, Massachusetts, about a house there. And after writing that book, people really started contacting me um, and telling me that they'd had experiences that you know they suspected they were sensitive and. Some people were quite terrified by it, and you know, what do I do? How can I, you know, either stop this or you know, make it so I can control it? And um, so, one of my book sightings uh, was at Terrapin Traders, which is a metaphysical shop in Gardner. Uh, the owner said, "You should do a paranormal 101 class here. I think that might be fun." And so we set it up and just see what happened. And uh, I now have, you know, uh, probably 12 to 15 students. Wow. And uh, I teach two days a week, and we cover a broad range of paranormal topics, everything from uh, how to lucid dream to, uh, you know, what is a ghost and expanding your abilities and uh, talking about different divining tools. And we just have fun. Each week it's a different topic. We did uh, connecting with your spirit guides this week. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just in entertaining, and it's good because it really uh, has – enriched a lot of people's lives people that have been uh, had this ability but didn't have anybody to talk to and you know that's really a big thing because if you're sensitive you can't tell the people at work that sometimes you can't tell your family and sometimes your friends you know people roll their eyes at you because not everybody buys into that yeah and, been the and, same forum. and, and even and look, I mean, in today's world it's gotten a little better I mean, I, there was a time where you really could not have like a serious conversation about the paranormal uh, with a group of people uh, without, you know, somebody giggling. And, and But, you know, now it's a lot easier to do. You right. Can, you can have a conversation, a real conversation about the paranormal with a person or a group of people, and you can get some intelligent discourse going. Uh, and... You know, because I remember there was a time when, you know, maybe once or twice a year, like when the family gets together, you get together at Thanksgiving, well, somebody's going to tell a ghost story. Mm. Or maybe you get together at Christmas, somebody's going to tell a ghost story. Uh, but, you know, obviously at Halloween, and it's all kind of tongue-in-cheek then. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, there was really not much real serious conversation about anything paranormal. There were one or two television shows on now you can't get away from them right and right so there's a proliferation uh what's your and again you know you can answer this as delicately as you'd like what what's your take on just a just a waterfall rush of paranormal media paranormal television movies it's just it, it's it's become part of pop culture yeah, definitely. I mean, it's something that grabbed the public's interest, and eventually I think people will um, ease off of it somewhat because it is a trend, but so many people are sensitive, and they're drawn to that because they're looking for answers. So I think uh, there's probably more and more sensitives coming out, maybe because of the paranormal shows that they're realizing that they, too, have an ability that they may have ignored or blamed on something else. Um, in the past so you know who knows I, I do notice like a lot of these paranormal shows there's uh, there there's a lot of uh, demons on them now it's like, <laughs> like they ran out of things the them. demon show oh yeah it's like ghosts don't scare people anymore let's go to demons you know so you see a lot of that and I really don't feel there's as many demons out there as those shows you know try to portray but, uh, you know, it's all about getting ratings. Some of the shows are more accurate than others. Uh, I've investigated in places some of these shows have been to. And, uh, you know, I was on site when uh, Ghost Adventures investigated at the Victorian. So I can tell you that they were accurate uh, with their findings because they got the same things that we got, the same voices, same, you know, kind of EVPs and responses. But some of the other shows, um, you know, we've gone behind them to different locations and, pretty much debunked what they called evidence what well, is well, you know how surprising right uh, 
But like you said, they they have to get ratings, which means they have to make things happen on on right. camera. Right. Uh, and as you know, most paranormal investigations are not exciting. Right. <laughs> right. And so if you're watching a uh, you know a half hour show or a sixty minute show got to have some EVPs and some shadows on the wall and, and uh, some inexplicable voice, you know, just uh, it's, it's, it's entertainment. Right. And uh, hopefully people, people are able to differentiate, you know, entertainment from actual research. Uh, but uh, it is something that's uh, some, you know, there's some days you can just be flipping through the channels. And it's amazing how, you know, it's it's ghost this, ghost that, ghost this, paranormal this. And it's amazing how many are on. Right. Um, and uh, But maybe you're right. Maybe it's a trend and we'll go through this saturation and people will get tired of it. I don't know. Uh, but um, right now it's, it's still very popular. So let me ask you this. Uh, were you always a writer or when did that happen for you? Were you... Uh, I started writing when I was 17 years old. I started, I switched high schools in my junior year, and I signed up for a creative writing class and learned that I had a knack for it. And uh, my teacher actually encouraged me to continue writing, and I did thank her in my first public, my first published book. And I made sure a copy got, I sent a copy to her, and of course. and it really did make her day to know that she made some kind of impact in somebody's life, but. It, uh, from that point, I just uh, was always writing, and um, I wrote six novels before I finally got one published, right. because back in the day, you had to have an agent, right. and getting an agent, you're more luckier getting struck by lightning than right. you are getting an agent, so I worked with a couple for a while, but uh, they just have so much coming in at them that they're looking for the next Stephen King, you yes. know, they're uh, so I did end up uh, self-publishing, and, and I've been very successful with it. It gave me an option to put my work out there and let the public decide whether they liked it or not. And You know, my books have an average uh, rating of like 4.7, 4.8 out of 5 stars for all 11 books. So the public's very happy with what I'm writing. So the agents kind of lost out on their cut of my royalties. You know, I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you brought this up because uh, I kind of, you know, know what you're talking about. Uh, you know, before the internet, really, uh, and I don't know if you had this experience. You know, you you go pick up a copy of the Writer's Market. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> you get the I've, copy. I've you just and you it. and you page after page after page of of submission guidelines and this okay. and that. Or you know, we only accept submissions from uh, writers with agents or through agents. Right. right, and all of that, and then you sit there and wonder, like, how do I get an agent? And, uh, and like you said, uh, they were looking for the next Stephen King, or, or you know, somebody that can sell a million copies of something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a little bit different today. I mean, obviously, we still want to sell a million copies, right? But things are a little bit different, and it's a little bit more accessible, I think wouldn't you say? It is definitely more accessible. Unfortunately, though, the market's flooded with, so with us indie authors. Yeah. Um, so anybody can publish a book at this point. So it's we leave it up to the Amazon or Barnes & Nobles or whoever you're going through, the reviewers, to, to sort them out what's worth reading and what's not worth right. reading. But it is hard to get the visibility. Without an agent, your book is not necessarily in every... Barnes and Noble across the country, but you know, people that are looking for ebooks have to filter through all the other stuff too right. to get to your stuff. So you have to really build up a following. And it's hard, and it, and it becomes more of a challenge to stand out right. uh, because it's it's like you said, it's flooded. And but you know, hey, that's that's the game. Uh, and uh, but it looks like you're you're doing very well here. Uh, you know, I'm just I was just looking at your at what you have here on Amazon and it's very impressive. Do you have anything in the works now or coming up? Or I do actually. I have two books that I'm working on. One, I decided that um, I'm going to pull my Paranormal 101 class notes uh -huh. together into a book and I'm going to call it Paranormal 101 and uh, this will be book one because as I keep teaching classes, I keep researching and writing 
class notes on each subject. So, um, so I'm working on that, and then I'm also working on another true paranormal story based on uh, a shaman friend of mine named Michael Robichaud, who lives in Virginia, and he does he assists people like me uh, who ha often have ghosts follow them home, which is kind of scary if you yeah. don't. Know them out of your house you end up living with them and they get stronger and it gets worse and he is able to uh, remotely uh, come come in and, and get them out which is you know to me I'm I, you know I know some of what I said probably sounds crazy to a lot of people but I'm a big skeptic and unless I see something and I'm able to experience it myself I'm not going to just buy into what people tell me um, you know, unless I get uh, so many different opinions that, that they all seem to point towards the same thing, then I may give it some relevance. But, uh, you know, when he sent, he sends his spirit guides in and I could hear them being clear out and I could hear a tone sound like laser lights zapping around my room and, 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 and then my cats were following the sound that I was hearing, you know, they were laying on the bed with flattened ears, you know. And then the next day, the ghosts were all gone. So to me, you know, that was successful. And I've used him probably a dozen times. And he's pulled some nasty things out of my house. Wow. Well, so, ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking with author and investigator and teacher, yes. Joni Mahan. And she has authored such books as Devil's Toy Box, Bones in the Basement, Soul Collector. And I love this trilogy. It's the Winter Woods Trilogy, uh, Spirit Board, Corvus, and Labyrinth. But she also has the following titles. Ghostly Defenses, A Sensitive's Guide for Protection. Angel Storm. Emperor Rain. Now, is this, Emperor, is this another series here? It's a trilogy. It another was my trilogy, first, okay. Yeah, it was my first trilogy that I published. So um, it's a post-apocalyptic kind of a dystopian I don't really want to call it Hunger Games like but okay. it does follow that same um, genre just in a different format okay so what I'm telling all you guys uh, you need to hop over to Amazon she's got a lot of great titles uh, that you need to pick up I, I'm definitely going to be this devil's toy box is intriguing and this soul collector I've got to I've got to read so, and please, look, don't email me saying that you can't find it. I'm, I'm on the page right now. I know how some of you guys are. Uh, you like to pretend that you can't find it. Uh, she is all over Amazon. She's got a million books here. She's a great lady, and we definitely want to thank her for joining us. And, Joni, you've been a great guest. And at some point, uh, we won't wear you out, but we'll try to get you back on uh, at a later time. Is that cool? That's cool with me. Absolutely. So we want to thank her for being our guest tonight. Well, we're at the end of another episode of the Shadowland Radio Show. We'd like to, again, thank everybody. I cannot thank you guys enough for subscribing on 